Welcome to part two of learning to program in assembly language on the PIC. So last week we covered a few things on getting set up and using MPLAB and we created a Blink program uh, which we uploaded to the microcontroller just to show the basic steps that um, you need to do to get started. So in this video we're going to extend on that and we'll cover ports and how to control them, some of the most commonly used instructions which are called opcodes and some of the special function registers to manipulate data. So let's get started. So looking at ports, every microcontroller will have at least one or more ports. These are the pins that connect the controller to the outside world and can be either inputs or outputs as defined with the TRIS-X opcode. So looking at this diagram here, we've basically got port RA0 through to 7, uh, B0 through to 7, RC0 to 7, and RD0 to 7. So each of them is eight physical pins, which can be inputs or outputs that we can connect to any device external to control it or read data from it. Depending on the microcontroller you use, a, a port could be an input such as this RA0, or it could be an output, or it could be something completely different like reading an analog voltage. So ports can do all different functions and it depends on your controller as to what they can do. So in some cases they can be used for serial data such as we've got around here, um, reference voltages for your analog inputs outputs, they can be used for counting pulses, there's a whole range of applications that these ports can be used for and that can be both in the input and the output side of things. So you may use an output as a sine wave generator if you've got a digital to analog converter. Now I'm going to introduce you to a magical document that uh, most technicians will never read. It's called the data sheet, but I do recommend you actually get a copy of it. It's uh, easy to download off of the website. Just search for the chip number and you'll find it. Um, so in here, I'm going to jump straight to page 14 and this gives us a description of all of the different ports uh, possible uses. So we've got RC0 is a standard I.O. so input output port so it can either be a 1 or a 0 but it can also be used as an output when we're using timer 1 as an oscillator or as an input to clock the timer instead of using the default crystal oscillator. So for every single port, there is a description like this that you can go through. Now, I know this is a scary concept that I'm saying that you should actually read a document. I, for one, am dyslexic. I hate reading, but be assured you don't need to read it cover to cover. It is 332 pages, but you probably only need about 25% of that. And I'll cover some of the major sections as we go through in uh, the next few minutes. Before we can start to look at controlling ports in the microcontroller, we need to take a look at something called the Special Function Reg Register, or SFR. Now, Special Function Registers are used to read and write to specific parts of the microcontroller. They're just names that tell the program what to do with specific data at a specific address. You've already been using several of them in the, uh, the Blink program, so looking at the code here, we've got TRIS-C, so that is one special function register. Port C is another one. And there's actually a third that's a little bit harder to see, but it's down here where we have the move LW. So the W in here is referencing the special function register called WREG. And that's a point where we can move data in and out and share it between different registers to manipulate the data. So then we're doing a move W, so move from the W register to an F register. So the F stands for a function register, which could be a special function register, or as in this case, it's one that we've created ourselves as just a variable. So basically we're moving into a memory location. Now going back to that magical document, if we jump to page 47, we have a list of all the special function registers and we've actually got the name 
and the physical memory location that it's at. Now, you don't really need to know this, but that's where the memory location numbers in the last page came from. So we have WREG somewhere down here, and there's its physical memory location. And we've also got the ones we've been talking about. We've got our ports, so port C we've played with. We've got our TRIS. And scrolling down even further, we will see a description for each of these. So we'll just go down. So we've got WREG, which stands for Working Register. A fair bit further down, we should see the TRIS. So TRIS sets the data direction for each of the ports. And then we've got the ports themselves. So what we've got set up is a new circuit that now instead of having the one LED as we had in Blink, it has three LEDs from RC0, RC1, RC2. And we've got a button. Now it's actually drawn to RC7 here, but I've just realized in the program it's actually on RC3. So you could remap that in the program or change the pin, whatever suits you. The oscillator we're working with is 12 megahertz and that will come into play because we're using delays and we need to know about clock cycles. So the actual um, chip setup is the three LEDs. So it's one or RC0, RC1 and RC2. And then my switch on our program does RC3. So like in the last video, I've used my boilerplate template to get started. I've got my standard header block. I've got some variables which will give you a little bit of detail on shortly. Then I've created a function called init or initialization. And what that does is a call statement tells it to find where that function is which is just a, a name and that will tell you to initialize port C that we have three ports or three bit set as outputs and the rest are inputs. So these will be my LEDs and bit three will be my switch. The return then sends it back up to the next instruction after the call, which is bra. So that's branch and it branches to loop. So a branch just redirects program. It doesn't remember where it came from. The program will then flow through and initially set port C to have a value of 1, which means LED 1 is on. And then we'll, after delaying for a short time, increment the port value. So it'll go from 1 to 2, and then up to 3 and 4 and so on, displaying up to 7 in binary on those LEDs. After it's done that once, it will test to see if the button has been pressed. If it's not pressed, so this is a, a bit test F skip if set. So we're testing if port C is one, which means set. If it is, we will jump over um, this line. So it's skip means jump over a line. We will set all LEDs to zero and right up to port C, and then we'll loop back into here again and do that test again. And if the button's been released, it will not skip, it will instead go to this branch to loop, which will bring it back up to here. And it will do another count and retest forever. So down below, I've got a delay loop, similar to what I had in the last video. And it basically has been set up to time based on the 12 uh, megahertz chip, sorry, crystal, to do a 500 millisecond delay. And that's done by having the loop do lots of 100 milliseconds, which I've defined by working out the time for one clock pulse and then how long each loop will take. So I'll go into that in more detail in yet another video, but for now, we're just gonna look at the instructions and what each of them does. Yeah, right here, do it. Do it. Do it. 